Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to this week's uh, TSVP talk. So this week we're joined by Mark Wilden from uh, Royal Holloway University of London. And Mark is going to be here at OIST until the 10th of November and has an office here in Lab 4 on floor F22D if you have lots of questions and want to track him down after today's talk. Mark received his PhD at the University of Oxford in 2004 and since 2018 has been a full professor at Royal Holloway. He's also spent the last year as an honorary senior visiting researcher at the Heilbronn Institute for Mathematical Research at the University of Bristol, and has also uh, been awarded an ATIA Fellowship of the London Math Society, and will be visiting the American University of Beirut in Lebanon, uh, I believe, next year. So today, Mark is going to tell us all about primes, partitions, and power series. All right. Well, thank you very much, Liron, for that very nice introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be here at OIST. It's uh, been a wonderful change of scene for me and a chance to catch up on my research and collaborate with all the strong mathematicians doing the subject we love as part of Liron's group in representation theory and algebraic combinatorics. And that's what I want to give you some idea about today. Uh, but, but first, let me just explain briefly why I seem to have all these multiple affiliations. So my, my home university is indeed Royal Holloway, part of the University of London. But I've been on the comment for the previous academic year and the coming one at this place called the Heilbronn Institute, which is attached to Bristol University. Uh, and the Heilbronn Institute is a curious place. It has two dual purposes. One is to promote pure mathematics in Britain, and it does that by sponsoring conferences, workshops, and most importantly, postdoctoral fellowships. And the postdocs there, and people like me that are seconded, spend half their time in this wonderful state where we can do any kind of maths that we like. Uh, but the Herborn Institute isn't just a charity. Uh, it also exists to do cryptographic research on behalf of the British government. And that's what we spend our other 50% of the time doing. Uh, and that's why there isn't a picture of it there, because I don't break the Official Secrets Act when I'm on holiday, sorry, and when, when I'm on important visits in Japan. Uh, but instead, there's a nice picture of Brunel's suspension bridge over the Avon Gorge. Anyway, so enough of that. What I, I want to tell you about is a part of a mathematical story which stretches from Euclid, uh, the guy on the left, to the great Indian mathematician Ramanujan uh, and beyond. If time permits, I will talk a bit about Turing and Gerdell. And well, this talk is, is intended really for a general audience, not even perhaps for people as technically minded as you. So if you find it all too basic, well, okay, I apologize. But at any rate, you will have had the unique experience of having been at a mathematics seminar delivered by a professional mathematician and wishing at the end that the speaker had gone into more technical detail. Well, let's see how it goes. So I took this little snippet of Euclid from a picture which I think should be more famous than it is. Uh, in my view, it is vastly superior to the Last Supper, and there's something controversial to start with. It's uh, Raphael's uh, School of Athens, and if you know any classical philosopher, it's likely that they appear here somewhere, but I can't promise to identify all of them for you. Uh, the central figures are Plato uh, and Aristotle. Uh, there's many others. Uh, the badly dressed person there He's probably an academic. No, uh, that's Diogenes, famous for living in a barrel. Uh, that one is Heraclitus, uh, famous for you can't step in the same river twice. Uh, also famous for finding philosophy a rather depressing experience, but still sticking with it all his life. Uh, the one uh, I admire most is the guy in the rather nondescript gray-green cloak. Uh, any guesses who that might be? Uh, he's the only person I feel who actually looks like he might be interested in the people he's talking to. 
Everyone else here is just sort of posing slightly. Oh yes, I made it into this great fresco. Uh, but Socrates, uh, that is he, uh, actually does seem to be talking to some people. And of course that's entirely appropriate because Socrates is now famous for his dialogues. Uh, Socrates, of course, would have made a very poor academic because he never published anything. Well, everything we know about Socrates survives because of what his student Plato uh, recorded. Uh, Socrates was much more interested in dialogue, in, in discussion with people. Uh, he went around Athens pointing out to people in the politest possible way that they were thinking in a completely woolly way and that most of their ideas were wrong. Uh, and you can imagine how popular this made him, uh, but I, I won't dwell on his, well, slightly unfortunate ending. Uh, but anyway, there's Socrates, who I'll come back to. Uh, and the guy with the slate bending down, uh, that's Euclid. And I want to start my story with part of Euclid's elements, uh, proposition nine from book 20. So it's all about prime numbers. So, well, spot the prime, and for bonus points, uh, spot the Gret and Dieck prime. So I'm sure you all know that 31 is the unique prime number uh, in this little list of people playing this curious game. So 25, that's not prime because it's five times five. Everything else has a prime factor. Uh, even 57, although that might have come as a surprise to Gret and Dieck, uh, who we believe lived at such a vast plane of abstraction, even beyond the normal reaches of pure mathematics, that when asked for an example of a concrete instance of his theorem, he said, oh, well, just take a prime, 57, for example. Uh, but 57 is, is not a prime, but it's perhaps more famous now because of Gret and Dieck. Okay, uh, just a, a little aside, uh, one is not a prime. Well, says who? Well, says mathematicians. And it might come as a surprise to the Greeks because they thought one was a prime. But we've now realized that it actually works best if you declare that one, in, by definition, is not a prime. And the reason is that we want unique factorization. And if we made one a prime, then 57 would factor in the normal way, but it would also factor as one times three times 19, one times one times three times 19. And this will just muck up our whole beautiful fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So that's why we eventually realized that it was best to declare one not to be a prime. But if that guy was bearing down on me loudly insisting that one is a prime, I don't think I would be arguing with him. Okay, so here are some of the primes. They start two, three, five, seven, eleven. I'm sure, you know. Uh, here is a slightly bigger spiral. So, if I tell you that the smallest gap on a spiral's arm is forty, uh, you should be able to work out why there are sixteen arms to the spiral. Uh, because the phi function of forty is sixty. But anyway, this all strongly suggests that the sequence of primes goes on for some time. Uh, we should be able to find 27, 2017 there, that's the uh, most recent prime. Uh, you're going to have to wait another five years for the next prime year. So here is the sequence. Uh, then it will be followed immediately, well, as soon as possible by another prime. Uh, going on a bit more, uh, a billion and seven is prime, uh, a billion and nine is prime. So the big question is, does the sequence of primes go on forever? Or perhaps it stops. Perhaps there's some really big number, which is the biggest prime number. And beyond that, everything has a proper prime factor. All the numbers are composite. So well, I expect you know the answer, but a thing of beauty is a joy forever as Keats wrote about the Grecian urn, but I think it applies just as much to mathematical truths. So I'd like to just revisit Euclid's proof for you. And if you read Euclid's original proof, apart from being phrased in terms of lengths of lines, because for the Greeks, everything was geometric rather than uh, a number. In fact, they didn't even really have a very good notation for numbers. 
they repurposed their alphabet for it, but it doesn't work hugely well. But anyway, if you reread Euclid's original proof, uh, you'll find that what I'm going to give you more as an example of the proof is essentially what he considered a vigorous demonstration. So we'll do it by a little example. Suppose someone is under the mistaken belief that two, three, and five are all the primes. Well, we multiply them together to get 30, and we add one, uh, there is 31. And we now consider uh, that when we divide by this supposed complete list of primes, two, three, and five, every time we see a remainder, we always see a remainder of one, but every number is divisible by some prime number. So there must be some prime, either it's 31 itself, well it is, or some prime we've missed that's not two, three, or five and happens to divide 31. But either way, there's a prime that isn't in that list. So we were mistaken in thinking we collected all the primes. And there is, is going through. Uh, suppose we do it with the first six primes. Well, you multiply them together, you add one, you observe that there's always a remainder of one. Uh, so again, we deduce that there must be some new prime. Uh, and in this case, uh, I put this in because um, 30,031 is in fact not prime. Uh, it has a prime factorization but still we manage to pick up some new prime. So the argument presented by Euclid, as it's usually given now, is essentially just the general version of that. Uh, and I'd like to present it as a little dialogue between our, our friends Socrates and Euclid. Uh, but just to turn the tables on Socrates for once, he's going to be the keen student and Euclid will be the one with all the answers. So here is Socrates with the mistaken belief that he's collected all the prime numbers. Um, so Euclid says to him, uh, please multiply them together and add one. And well, Socrates knows he's part of a Socratic dialogue and no one ever gets bored or says they've had enough in a Socratic dialogue. Uh, so he says, okay. Uh, and Euclid makes the same observation I've made, just slightly more algebraically, but uh, it still applies. In fact, maybe it's even easier to see now because when you divide n by a pi, there is rather obviously going to be this remainder one left over. Uh, Socrates admits he's correct. Uh, many Socratic dialogues are essentially Socrates saying things and then his interlocutor saying, gosh, you are right. You are correct. How clever you are. Uh, anyway, Euclid, n is divisible by some point. And Socrates is therefore forced to admit that there is a prime not in his list. And Euclid concludes that this shows that there are more than any finite number of primes, because we could have run this dialogue, we could have run this argument of any finite collection of primes, and we would have found that there was uh, one more. And Socrates admits he is correct. Okay. Uh, well, it's a wonderful thing about mathematics, but any time we can revisit this argument in the laboratory of our minds and be convinced ourselves afresh that there are infinitely many primes, or if we want to be a bit more ambitious, perhaps infinitely many primes congruent to three mod four, uh, or five mod six, or not congruent to one mod 10. Uh, there are in increasing levels of difficulty but I suspect you'll be able to work out how to do it. All refinements of, of this uh, Socratic, well, Euclidean argument. Uh, there's one feature I'd like to point out about the argument because people often get this wrong and it makes it seem more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, so we've got this statement P, there are finitely many primes. This is incorrect uh, and it's logical negation which I phrased like this, there are more than any finite number of primes, because that's how uh, Euclid's conclusion is often translated nowadays. The Greeks didn't like to talk about actual infinity. They were quite rightly uh, aware that uh, talking about infinite numbers can cause problems. Uh, so instead, well, we would say there are more than any finite number, which is, I, I think, how most people, if pushed, would understand the word infinite. Infinite means not finite. 
So in the Euclid proof, uh, we showed not P is true by assuming P and getting a contradiction. So since P is false, we are obliged to conclude that not P is true. Everything is either true or false. So notice that we did not do a classical proof by contradiction. Uh, this is a proof by negation. And the difference does actually matter to some people. If it was a proof by contradiction, we would have started with Q, we'd have got a contradiction from not Q, and from that we would be entitled to infer not not Q, which for most mathematicians is logically identical to Q, uh, but not for everyone. But the thing is Euclid's proof does not need to raise these issues. Even intuitionists have to accept Euclid's proof. And I'll, I'll come back to this whole business of, well, what do we mean by mathematical statements and what do we mean by, by proofs towards the end of my talk? Okay. So I want to head on to things which are a little more typical of what I work with day to day. So I'll start with compositions. So a composition of a natural number is a way to write it as a sum of natural numbers, uh, possibly itself. Uh, I allow that four is a composition of four. And the eight compositions of four are all written there. So a little exercise. How many compositions are there of three? Well, I'm going to do it for you. Uh, there's three, two plus one, one plus two, that counts as a different composition, and one plus one plus one. So there's four. Uh, and there's two compositions of uh, two and one composition of one. So one, two, four, eight. So perhaps by now you're guessing that the number of compositions is going to be some power of two. But of course, we would like to, to prove that. And I'm going to show you the kind of proof that I admire most, uh, a bijective proof. And the idea is that we consider the partial sums in these compositions. So say I take one plus two plus one, well, one is one, one plus two is three, and one plus two plus one is four. So its partial sums make the set one, three, four. And you can do this to all of them. The only partial sum of four is four, three is three, you add one, you get four. You're always going to end four because everything is a composition of four, but I put it in anyway, because that's where we stop. So there are the eight subsets corresponding to the compositions. And if I get rid of four, I've now got these eight subsets. And I think you can see that these are every possible subset of one, two, three. And because I've made a bijection, I've made a one-to-one -one correspondence with these subsets, we should be able to play the same game going back. So pick your favorite subset of one, two, three. Uh, I shall just pick one, three, find it here. Uh, imagine that they are the partial sums once you've shoved in four. That means we must have started one, then we added two, then we added one. So it corresponds to the composition one plus two plus one. So this is all just to convince you that there is a bijective correspondence between the compositions we wanted to count and subsets not of uh, one up to n, but one up to n minus one. So to count the number of compositions, we just need to count the number of subsets. And well, I claim that this is something easier to do. Uh, I feel it should be obvious. I feel if I was allowed to go up to someone on the street, oh dear, well, it, the language barrier would immediately be a problem for me, which I'm not proud of. Imagine I'm back in the UK. Well, I go up to someone on the street, or more likely since I live in central Bristol, I'm asked by a homeless person for some money. And I say to them, I shall be happy to oblige, but first may I have your opinion on this. How many subsets do you think there are of one up to n or n minus one? Well, I hope I would be able to convince them that it was two to the power n minus one, and that this wasn't a terribly deep fact. Because after all, for each element of one up to n minus one, You've just got a binary yes, no choice. Do I put it in? So you've got two choices for one, multiply it by your two independent choices for two, and so on. And eventually you will reach two to the power 
n minus one. So by our bijection and by our ability to count subsets, this gives us a perfect count of the number of compositions. And well, what we've really done here is show that these sets are isomorphic. Uh, two sets are isomorphic in the category of sets, if and only if they have the same number of elements. But the isomorphism was chosen to be particularly memorable. We didn't just pair them up in some random way. We had some structure to it. Uh, and I want to just try to explain or give you some flavor of what mathematicians mean by by isomorphic, because it is absolutely central to, to what I get up to uh, as an algebraist. Uh, but, but it would take rather a long time to set up the algebra. So I'm going to do it in another way by doing some juggling. So juggling is um, well, a very mathematical thing. Uh, it um, has a notation called site swaps. And so far, everything I've done is an instance of a single site swap, three, three, three. Uh, I'm just waving my hands around in a complicated way. Uh, but if I depart from that and do something a bit more ambitious, uh, then you can probably tell that the rhythm has changed. Uh, and that was a non-isomorphic trick. Uh, but the difference between this and that is nothing except five years of practice. Mathematically, <laughs> mathematically uh, they are completely, oh, thank you, um, completely uh, identical in structure. So that was isomorphism versus non-isomorphism. If you remember one thing, perhaps make it that. So I'll now go on to the partitions that were uh, part of my title. So partitions are a special kind of composition where the numbers have to be written in decreasing order, uh, weakly decreasing, non-increasing, if you prefer, because you're allowed to repeat a part. So the partitions are four, there's five of them, four, three, one, two, 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 one, one, and one, 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 one. Uh, so the number of partitions, P of four is five. And here's a little table showing the number uh, for small n. And well, there's no longer any particular the obvious pattern, I hope you'll agree, uh, although there are many very beautiful non-obvious patterns. Uh, I'll just draw your attention to one. Uh, take all the n which are congruent to 4 modulo 5, uh, so like 4, 9, and 14. Uh, you'll find that the number of partitions is always divisible by 5. Uh, 5, 30, 135. Uh, and well, the mathematician I'll come to, Ramanujan, found a particularly spectacularly beautiful proof of this. Uh, there are also somewhat bijective proofs where you take that set of partitions and partition it, divide it up into five sets which are visibly of the same size. Uh, this is done using the famous uh, rank or its successor, the crank of partitions. Uh, but I don't want to tell you all about that today. It would be an entire talk. Uh, so I'll tell you just a little bit about what concerns some of the early workers in the field of partitions. So they wanted an asymptotic formula for how fast P of N grows. And this is now something we can explore very neatly on the computer. Uh, so here's a couple of graphs. Uh, there's P of N, and you can see it growing fairly quickly. So your first guess might be, Perhaps it grows exponentially. After all the compositions, they grew exponentially with base two. So perhaps partitions are like the compositions, but they just grow a bit more slowly. Uh, but when you take logs, uh, it doesn't really look like that. Because if it was exponential growth and you take logs, it should be a straight line. And this is really a bit more curved. Uh, but if you mess around a bit more, uh, you might try thinking this looks a bit like the square root function. So we'll try log p of n over root n. And that looks like it might perhaps be heading to a limit. Slightly tendentious, I know, because of course I do know what the answer is. Uh, but you can demonstrate this. If you do a log log plot, uh, then you can see the convergence quite neatly. By uh, the time you've got to 10 to the 10, uh, log p of n over root n, 
is extremely close to uh, what the uh, eventual limit is. So the hardy ramanujan theorem is the strongest version of this. So what I try to demonstrate to you is that log p of n grows about like square root n. So it has a sort of complicated kind of intermediate growth. P of n is something like e to the root n. And Hardy and Ramanujan proved this in a stronger form, nailing down all the constants exactly. So this little sim symbol here means that the ratio of the sides tends to one as n tends to infinity. Uh, in fact, to be completely honest, Hardy and Ramanujan proved something even stronger. Uh, they gave a divergent series for P of n. Uh, and divergence, divergent, there isn't a typo. Uh, their series doesn't converge, but it's still very useful for, for calculating P of n, because although it diverges if you add up too many terms, if you pick the right place to stop, uh, you will be within 0.5 of the correct value, uh, which is a really remarkable uh, achievement. Uh, and well, I, I want to mention one of one of my papers, uh, which, which I'm quite proud of because it was my um, second published paper uh, after a time I'd had a slightly fallow period. Uh, and I was interested in partitions because of my research in representation theory. And uh, I used one of the tools from my work, this, this abacus, which is a certain way of representing partitions to uh, get asymptotic estimates for their number. Uh, and I gave what mathematicians would call an elementary proof of this slightly weaker version of Hardy Ramanujan. Uh, here, elementary should probably have a very heavy pair of inverted commas, uh, because what it means is I didn't use complex analysis. Uh, I did build on what other people had done using real analysis. And my proof involves a whole pile of epsilons and deltas. Uh, but, but it was just a real analytic proof that you know, even I could understand. Okay. So yeah, I was interested in partitions because they come up in my research. And well, I want to try to give you some idea of, of that. Uh, and a good sort of linking point is this idea of generating functions. So a generating function for a combinatorial sequence is a way of recording all the values of that sequence in a single object. Uh, so we take p of zero, p of one as the coefficient of x, p of two as the coefficient of x squared, and so on. So what I've defined here by capital P of x is simply some kind of power series. Uh, since we know the small values of p, I can tell you how it starts. Uh, it's 1 plus x plus 2x squared plus 3x cubed, 5x to the 4, 7x to the 5, 11x to the 6, 15x to the 7, 22x to the 8. Can you tell I spend a lot of my youth just writing out partitions? Uh, I find it incredible that this has actually been a source of employment for me. Uh, so the thing is, although there is no simple formula for P of n, uh, there is a very beautiful closed formula for its generating function. Uh, and this is not actually serotypical, but it's still a little miracle one should enjoy. So as a warm up, uh, although I feel this audience probably doesn't need it, we're going to do a sort of slightly easier special case. So let Q of N be those partitions where the parts are distinct. So that means that you don't have any repetitions. So if the partitions are four, Four and three, one are good, distinct parts, partitions, but we don't count two plus two because that's got two as a part twice. And we don't count two plus one plus one or one added up four times because they've all got repeated parts. So we've now got another generating function Q of X. So that starts uh, one plus X plus two X squared plus two X cubed plus two X to the four and so on. Uh, and I claim that its generating function factorizes in this very simple way uh, as an infinite product. Maybe you can see how this is going to work. Because say I 
want to count the distinct parts, partitions of four. Well, what's going to happen when I multiply this out? How can I get a coefficient of x to the four? Well, I could just take x to the four and one, 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 and that would be like the partition four. Or I could take three plus one. And that would be it. I can't take two plus two because I've only got one power of x squared. So when I multiply this out, I will get coefficient two attached to x to the four. And you can play the same game with three and check that it will be three or two plus one. So here is a complete proof. When you multiply out the right hand side, coefficient of x to the n is visibly the number of ways to write x as a sum of natural numbers. And that is what I mean by a distinct parts partition. So we'll just ramp this up slightly and run the same argument to do uh, all general partitions. So my proposition says that P of X is this infinite product here. And the proof is, well, you expand each factor as a geometric series. So it looks a bit more like what we had for the distinct parts partitions. In fact, that would be just like one plus x, one plus x squared, stopping a bit sooner. But you see, now the, the menu of options open to us includes more different powers of x. And we'll be able to use these different powers to encode a completely general partition as a way of multiplying out the brackets. And here's the rule. So say I take x to the m1 from the first bracket, x to the 2m2, notice that all the powers are even. So I'll be taking an x to the 2m2 from the second bracket, an x to the 3m3 from the third bracket, and so on. Uh, when I multiply out in this way, I'll get a contribution of one to the coefficient of the sum, 4m4 and so on, all being omitted. And this is exactly counting the partition that has m1 parts of size one, m2 parts of size two, altogether contributing two m2, m3 parts of size three, altogether contributing three m3, and so on. Uh, so the coefficient you'll get of x to the n is p of n. Uh, let's just do a quick example. It's something that undergraduates are never taught, but you can always turn a proof into an example. So let's do this one. 3 plus 3 plus 2 plus 3 ones. So the multiplicities there are three lots of the part one, one lot of the part two, two lots of the part three. So I take three times one, one times two, two times three, picking out these powers. So I've got x cubed, x to the five, x to the six. I multiply them together to get x to the 11, which is indeed the size of this partition. 3, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11. And again, you, you can go back. So pick a way to expand this product. Say I take x to the 9 there, just 1 there, and x squared there. Well, that means I took three parts of size 3 and two parts of size 1. So that was encoding the partition 3, 3, 3, 1, 1. Uh, I can't do, say, the partition uh, with a, the partition 10 plus 1, because I would need the brackets, which are somewhere over here. But, well, the idea still works. OK, so that, that gives you some idea of generating functions. And I, I'd like to show you one more example where we perhaps use them to prove something a bit less obvious. So here's a proposition. The number of partitions of n into odd parts is equal to the number of partitions of n into distinct parts. So we've already discussed distinct parts and odd parts. Well, that just means what it says. Uh, so as a little example, there are eight odd part partitions of nine. I've listed them here. Uh, and there are eight distinct parts partitions of nine. So uh, if you look at some other cases, you'll find the numbers agree too. So can we make a bijection between them? Can you find some simple rule that will map from one side to the other? Well, if, if you can, and you've never seen this before, um, you've done something seriously impressive. There are bijective proofs, some very beautiful ones, but none are completely obvious. 
And instead, I'd like to show you how to do it using generating functions. Uh, so here is a generating functions proof. Uh, we will take the generating function for the odd parts partitions, which by the same idea I showed you before uh, is a product like this, except now we're only doing odd parts. So I only want to see the odd numbers here. So if you remember before, one over one minus X squared became one plus X squared plus X to the four and so on. And we used that to get parts of size two. Well, now I don't want parts of size two. They're off the menu. So I just get rid of that factor. So the left-hand side has this infinite product as its generating function. Uh, and now I'm going to just manipulate it algebraically. Uh, so for no very obvious reason, but it's something you could, you could do, uh, I insert a whole pile of ones. And then I rearrange the numerator by sliding all of these factors a bit to the left. So now I've got one minus X squared over the one minus X, one minus X to the four from there over one minus X squared uh, and so on. And when you do the uh, product of two, difference of two squares identity on it, you get one plus X, one plus X squared, one plus X cubed, which uh, I hope you remember, it was only one slide ago, is the generating function for the distinct parts partitions. So if you accept this argument, you are forced to agree that these two sequences, the first sequence counting the odd parts partitions and the second sequence counting the distinct parts partitions, you are forced to agree that they have the same generating function. Uh, it might look different, but it is the same. So since they've got the same generating function, they are the same sequence. Uh, QED. So I quite like this because it's a, it's a non-trivial application of generating functions, but, but not, not, not too hard. Uh, and it's a kind of proof that, well, uh, I, I really enjoy. Uh, so as I said, there are also bijective proofs, but, but they need a bit more work. Uh, uh, and I think I, I won't show you one now, but you, you can ask me at the end and, or uh, come and see me, you know where to find me. I, I want to talk to you about your work. If you think you've got any problems that might benefit from uh, some pure mathematical input, well, I'm very happy to talk to you and find out something about your research. But uh, here is a, a little one-liner for the experts here. Uh, the Brouwer character table of the symmetric group in characteristic two is square. Uh, and of course you will remember if you've seen all this, otherwise it makes no sense to you whatsoever, that the columns are labeled by the partitions with no even parts and the rows are labeled by the partitions with distinct parts. Uh, so there's a, a little algebraic proof, uh, excruciatingly highbrow, but an honest proof. Uh, you can get to the point where you understand all these objects without having first proved the theorem. Uh, so why do we care about all these different proofs? What's the point of having proofs at all? Why do we have multiple proofs? That, that's what I want to, to end my talk with. And well, I, I claim that we want proofs, partly, I have to admit, because we want to know what's true. But this really isn't, I think, the only reason. And particularly, say, when we're lecturing to undergraduates, it can't be the only reason. Because how many undergraduate students, well, of course, I'm sure you're all exceptional, but take the typical undergraduate student. I don't think they believe things like the fundamental theorem of calculus, because they can retreat to their, their mental gym and mentally rehearse the proof. I think they believe it because they've been told it and they found it in the textbooks, and perhaps because they have experience of knowing that it works. So the point of proofs isn't just to decide what is true or false. Uh, I think proofs are important in undergraduate teaching principally because they are repositories of ideas. Because proofs are correct arguments, they are memorable arguments. 
This is one reason why so much philosophy, philosophical discussion I find hard to remember, because I'm never completely convinced whether it's right. But I find mathematical proofs, particularly the elegant proofs I like so much, highly memorable because they are convincing and they help to tie together all the different strands of mathematical thought in my mind. So that would be my answer to what's the point of having all these multiple proofs, because they, they really give you genuinely different perspectives. You know, here's the representation theory proof for experts. Here is a hint that there's a bijective proof. Earlier, I gave you the generating functions proof. Okay. So proofs are clearly something important. And uh, perhaps surprisingly, the relationship between proofs and truths was not completely clear. Uh, I mean, I think it was for many, many years, people thought that they were the same. And then people started to have their suspicions and realized they might not be. So that's what I want to, to end my, my talk with. And these are tricky things to discuss. And I find that perhaps the clearest way to present a lot of it is to use something even more modern than Gerdell, who was writing in the 30s, to use the language of modern computing. So that, that's where I want to, to finish my talk. So computing, as I expect you know, uh, began with this guy, um, Alan Turing. Uh, here is an extract from his report. Uh, it's slightly illegible, but well, I've read it more clearly. Uh, he must realize that the ability to put down a proof neatly on paper, uh, so it is intelligible, is important for a first-rate mathematician. Uh, and well, his school teacher had a point because after all, uh, mathematics papers are mostly words. Uh, I was reminded uh, of this example by uh, Professor Yuga Abdullah's very nice talk yesterday where uh, he talked about PDEs and harmonic functions. Uh, well, this is a complete proof of uh, Liouville's theorem in any number of dimensions. Uh, notice that it is mostly words. Uh, but anyway, going back to Turing uh, and the foundations of computing, uh, this is a BOM, the special purpose device. You wouldn't really call it a computer because it doesn't fit the von Neumann definition of a stored program computer. Uh, that came later in the war with Colossus and Turing's later work at the University of Manchester. Uh, but it was certainly a fiendishly important device uh, for its time, uh, which he used to, to crack Enigma. Uh, and now, uh, well, Turing is probably known thanks to Andrew Hodge's wonderful biography and films like The Imitation Game, mainly for his work uh, at Bletchley Park but probably intellectually he deserves most to be remembered for this theorem, uh, which stated slightly imprecisely, but not so imprecisely that I feel there's an issue. Uh, there is no algorithm that will decide the truth or falsity of a mathematical statement. So here are some examples of mathematical statements. There are infinitely many primes, that's true, and we proved it. Uh, one about partitions, true and proved. Infinitely many primes ending one. Oh, well, that's true and it can be proved, uh, but I haven't given you a proof today. Uh, infinitely many primes ending two. Uh, that's, of course, false. Uh, there's only one, in fact. Uh, a real function is equal to its Taylor series when that Taylor series converges. I'm sure you're all far too knowledgeable about this to be tricked. Uh, very tempting, but completely false. Uh, and here are a few more statements uh, where we just don't know. Uh, one I quite like is, is the partition function equally likely to be even or odd? Uh, I think almost everyone is convinced that it is equally likely in some sharp asymptotic sense, it's equally likely to be even as odd, uh, but we have no idea how to prove this. Uh, and the strongest results in this direction are, are quite weak. Uh, but notice that all these statements uh, they are all statements where we strongly believe that we will one day find a proof. Could there be statements that are simply unprovable? Uh, well, that's something that in fact follows from Turing's theorem here and was already known at the time when Turing was writing. 
It's a version of Gerdell's first incompleteness theorem. And I feel Gerdell's theorem is often misunderstood. Uh, I remember once I had a very long discussion with someone who's sort of perhaps been to some public lecture. And I'm sure it was a wonderful public lecture, but his takeaway was essentially, oh, you mathematicians, you think you're so clever, but you can't prove everything, which is sort of what Gerdell says, but it's sort of not as well. Uh, and I'd like to be a little bit more precise about it. Uh, so here is um, uh, Gerdell's theorem stated with, I feel, only justified in precision. So we fix a formal proof system and there exists a mathematically true statement. Everything is either true or false, but has no formal proof in that system. Now I'm not going to take 20 extra minutes to set up what I mean by a formal proof system, but, but here's a representative example. Uh, now a somewhat old fashioned one, no one uses this anymore, but it was very important at its time. Uh, Russell and Wrighthead's formal system they used in Principia Mathematica. Uh, this is a formal proof that one plus one is two. And you can see why we don't bother with them now, why we prefer to present mathematics slightly informally. But what I want you to observe is that this formal proof, it's just a long string of symbols. And in principle, you can feed this into a computer and it will verify that it is syntactically correct. Okay, so Gerdell's theorem says that there are correct statements that cannot be proved by any formal proof in the system. And it follows from what Turing proved about the Enschiedung's problem. So what Turing really showed is that there is no algorithm that will decide whether a Turing machine will halt. Uh, and when you apply this to the statement, uh, Turing machine M uh, halts, you, you then find that there is no algorithm that will decide the truth or falsity of even this special class of mathematical statements, hence the formulation that I gave you earlier. So we can now understand Gerdell's theorem as a corollary of Turing's theorem. So here is a proof. So what I'm going to show you first of all is that there is a form of incompleteness. So suppose for a contradiction that our system is complete, that every P is either provable or its negation, not P, is provable. And then we take our Turing machine and we let PM be the statement M halts. And then we can uh, spend week one trying to prove PM. Uh, we can spend week two trying to prove not PM. This is terribly like my life. We can spend week three trying again to prove PM. We can spend week four thinking, oh, that didn't work so well, I'll go back to not PM. But the critical difference is that because we're now enumerating formal proofs, and these formal proofs are just finite strings of symbols, and moreover, we have assumed that every statement is either provable or its negation is provable, we are going to win at some point we will find a proof. But that means we can detect whether or not Turing machine M halts, which according to Turing is something we cannot do. So therefore there must be statements P such that neither P nor its negation is true. Uh, sorry, is provable. Take one of these statements, uh, either Q or its negation is true. Everything is either true or false, but some things are not provable, which is precisely uh, what we wanted to show. Okay, so that's a deduction of Gerdell's theorem in a way that can be made rigorous out of Turing's work on the halting problem. And well, as we approach uh, an age where there will be working large scale quantum computers. We are constantly testing the limits of what it means to compute. And well, I, I find it very interesting that by understanding better and better what it means to compute, we can still understand better and better what it means for things to be true or false or provable uh, 
quite besides the joy of using computers like I did with those graphs to uh, explore our wonderful mathematical world. Okay, well, thank you very much. Any questions for Mark? Do you have any examples of uh, statements that are expected but not known to be unprovable? That's a good question. None leap to mind because many of the common statements of mathematics that we don't know about, like perhaps the parity of P of N or the Riemann hypothesis, um, in some sense, they must be provable. Because the argument is that if uh, um, if if they're not provable, it can only be because they're true. Because if they're false, you can just write down a counterexample. Like for the Riemann hypothesis, I can just write down a non-trivial zero if it's false. So a proof that the Riemann hypothesis is unprovable in a particular logical system has to be a proof that in fact it's true. Uh, and it would moreover be a proof that would convince professional mathematicians. Although I think it would come as a surprise to them that you needed a detour through a particular logical system. Uh, there are many interesting mathematical statements which uh, are not of the artificial nature of the Gerdell sentence that would have come out of the kind of proof I showed you. Uh, but are known to be unprovable. Uh, you could look up, say, Hercules and the Hydra for, for one of my favorite examples there. But yeah, the, these statements are the exception. On, on the whole, we believe that the axiomatic system we work in uh, day to day is powerful enough to prove the things we care about. Okay, thank you. Any questions? There are no more questions for Mark. But... Uh, the excellent questions. Should I care about convergence? Uh, Arguably, yes, because I was manipulating with power series. However, it would be very easy to see that the radius of convergence was a, at least a half. Um, but I would claim the more important answer is no, you do not have to care about convergence. And I can justify this from two different points of view. One is the way I set up generating functions simply as a device for storing all the numbers in the sequence at once. And from that perspective, a generating function is really just a formal object. It's like one of those formal strings of symbols that made up the formal proof. And you can manipulate these formal strings of symbols so that they form a ring with addition, multiplication, even division when you're not dividing by something in the unique maximal ideal. Uh, and it will all work. You don't need to care about convergence. Uh, the ring of formal power series is a complete discrete valuation ring with the non-Archimedean norm. So uh, whatever that means, take it from me, uh, you don't have to care. Uh, and uh, I'm not, I'm not uh, completely wild in, in having this view because, well, you could say read Wilf's wonderful book, Generating Functionology, where he discusses these issues. And you know, he says that for many purposes, like the proof I showed you, uh, in the end, we were just showing two sequences were equal. You don't have to care about conversions. Uh, but of course, we might then want to get asymptotic results from our power series. That, that's what Hardy and Ramanujan did after all. And then we have to care very much. But you know, just for getting things set up and understanding why the power series is what it is, you can relax. You have my permission, not that you need it. All right, if there are no further questions, then let's thank Mark once again.